Grit Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Ware. Appreciate you tuning in on Monday again. Hopefully all of you had a really good Thanksgiving. You got to spend time with friends and family. You got to enjoy yourself a little bit. But I think it's really important, you know, after a holiday like that, especially with the short amount of time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, to really get back into the flow of things as quickly as you can, get back to that routine, get back to working really hard on Monday. Sometimes it's easy to let those things linger on, you know, for the next couple days or the next week. You can fall behind on certain things. You can really start to, to feel the holiday. And then a lot of people just like, kind of let that turn into the Christmas holiday and it becomes just a long period of time of getting away from taking the strides you need to to accomplish your goals you know, whatever those may be. So again, hopefully you're getting back after it today on Monday. Hopefully this podcast episode can help you out with that a little bit. We're going to kind of talk about this next play mentality. And, and again, it could be next play, next day in business, whatever your situation calls for, very relatable to a lot of different people. And I don't know how many of you got to watch the PK-80. I'm a big basketball junkie, as I know a lot of you are too, that listen the PK-80 was this past week and finished up yesterday, but it was this big Phil Knight as the founder and CEO of Nike. Um, it's, it's basically around him. So it was a big basketball tournament, big Nike-sponsored tournament. All the teams that were in it were college basketball teams that have Nike as their sponsor. And it ultimately brought in the top teams in the country. It was a really, really big event. A lot of people tuned into it. Some fantastic games of teams and programs battling back and forth. And the way it was set up was there's two buildings in Portland right now, Portland, Oregon, which is where Nike is headquartered. There were two buildings. One is the old Trail Blazers Arena and one is the new. And they're actually right side by side. So one bracket was going on at one time and the other bracket was going on on the other. So there were two champions and then everybody kind of fell into place after that, again, based on you know, how you finished, how you won. If you won a game, you, you went on. If you lost, you went to the loser's bracket. Kind of like the way Little League Baseball is set up in a sense, but everybody got to play the same amount of games. But it caused a lot of different battles and matchups that you usually see towards the end of the year, probably in February and March, you know, in November, when a lot of these teams haven't prepared as much as they would, obviously, for the end of the year. So you got to just see a lot of the raw talent. You got to see some adjustments. And quite frankly, you got to see some mistakes that are made now that you know won't be made later or shouldn't be made later once everybody kind of adjusts and gets into the flow of things. And one particular example, I'm big on, you know, the, the effort level, the work ethic, being tough, all that kind of stuff. I, I preach that in my coaching and in my training. And I know a lot of the best coaches preach that same thing too. The accountability has got to be there, all that kind of stuff. And so, I know that this coach is probably going to be really upset when he goes back and he sees this. You could tell he was really upset in the moment when it happened. But the game in particular and the situation that I'm talking about occurred between Gonzaga and Florida, which for those of you that stayed up to watch, I feel bad for you if you didn't. It ended up being really late, almost into 2 in the morning out here on the East Coast. Um, but it basically went to double overtime. It was the last game of the night great battle, two really good teams. And I want to preface all this by saying I really like Coach Mark Few. I love what he does. And I actually really like this Gonzaga team. They're tough. They're hard-nosed. They've got some really good pieces. They play really, really hard. And it just happened to be that this little segment, quite frankly, could have cost them the game. Florida ultimately ended up winning in double overtime. And both teams were ranked in the top 25. I think at the time Florida was seven. They probably will move up. Gonzaga was 17th. They may stay right around there, move up a little bit. But I think both teams will be in the top 10 by the end of the year. I think there'll be teams that you see go deep into the tournament in March. I think team, both these teams will be at the top, if not winning their conference. Uh, so it's it's it was two really good teams. But again, it went to double overtime. And in the first overtime, there was a little bit of a stretch where a couple travels were called against Gonzaga players. You could tell the players were just frustrated. They were trying to help each other out. But that frustration then trickled over into the next play. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you the clip. If you're listening on the audio-only version on SoundCloud or iTunes, you can tune into our YouTube channel. It's the Competitive Greatness YouTube channel. And we'll put links so that you can go see that if you want to see the video clip. We also posted it on our Competitive Greatness Instagram, which is C, the letter C, Greatness Train. We'll put it on Grit Strength later as well on the Instagram account, and it'll be on both Facebook pages. 
but you'll be able to hear on the audio version what it looks like. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and play it right now so you can see exactly what I'm talking about, and then I'll get into that just a little bit more. Again. Nelson travel. Yeah, he did too. For the Zags tonight, for Coach Few. Going up. Boy, that has been a hot spot in that corner. Halfway down, Gonzaga was kind of walking back, and Chioza saw it and threw it ahead and halfway down. Here goes Williams and Perkins again. Kispert turned his ankle and he traveled. So you can see in those two clips, two different players on Gonzaga, and I believe the second one was a freshman, Kispert if I'm not mistaken. Two different players travel, a couple of the other players kind of look at the officials like they can't figure out why the call was made that way. The player who traveled himself kind of hangs his head for a second or at least doesn't get back on defense as quickly as he possibly can because he's worried about making a bad play. He's worried about turning the ball over. And again, I know how competitive athletes are. I was extremely competitive as an athlete. I'm still extremely competitive as a coach. But what players and athletes have to realize, and again, this can be in life and business as well, is you cannot hang your head on the previous play or the previous situation. You can't hang your head on, on a mistake. In the same way, you cannot hang your head on a lot of success. You can't look at the positives that are going on or see some success that you're having and then not continue to push forward. And again, in this specific instance, it quite literally cost them the game. Now, I'm not a big coach that likes to talk about if this would have happened, then this would have happened because there's a lot of things that could have changed based on that game. But here's the reality is Florida missed the first three. So Gonzaga got lucky. It's a tied game in overtime. The very next play, they don't jog it back. They don't sprint back and they throw it up the floor and get a wide open look and they make that one. So that puts Florida ahead by three. Now the rest of the first overtime goes how it did and it ends up in a tie. So they go to double overtime. Florida ends up winning in double overtime. Now, this is kind of twofold here. I look at this two different ways. One, again, if you're looking at it quite literally, if everything else stays the same, if Gonzaga maybe gets back on defense, they get a stop, and then everything falls the way it did, Gonzaga wins by three. They win by three in the first overtime. It's not tied, and the game's over. You can also look at it like this. Those two possessions, I think, dictated the way that Florida was playing at that point and the way Gonzaga was. I think it continued to dictate itself through the rest of the first overtime and in the second overtime. Gonzaga was hanging their heads. Florida was ready to go. They're getting on to the next play. Florida was very quick to get the ball out of bounds, move on to the next play, and keep going. Gonzaga took a little bit longer. So again, there could be some different variables that change the outcome of that game, but I remember watching this live, and that's why I continued to clip this and tried to give it to you all is as soon as I saw it live, one, I couldn't believe it. Two, I told our coaching staff about it the next day at practice so that we could relay that to our players. And three, just took me some time to even like really comprehend how big of a play that was. I knew it was big at the time. I didn't even myself put two and two together at the end of the game when Florida had won. But I did make a note to myself to go back and look just to kind of see how everything transpired after that. And that's a big play. I know it's only November, but think about if that happens in March. Think about if that's a Final Four game or even worse, the National Championship. You know, Gonzaga is just less than a year removed from being the national runner-up, which was a huge deal for their program. I think the first Final Four that Mark Few went to, an incredible coach. He's been there for years has worked really hard to build that program up. But think about that. Think about how those players would feel if that was the national championship. And that play, if they them not moving on to the next play, hurt their chances of being a national champion. It's tough. It's tough to think about. But to that same point, you know, they'll be able to go back and look at this. And I'm sure Coach Mark Few is going to play this a painful amount of time for those players. I know I would if I was a coach. 
just so that they know this is never going to happen again. And like I said, I like this team. I think they're really tough. They're hard-nosed. I think it was just the situation of the game. There were some young guys. Everybody was tired. I mean, they played a lot of games in a short amount of time, and this was a long game in and of itself. But again, there's no excuses for that. I think that they will learn from this and come back from it. But quite literally, like what we're talking about, they're going to have to move on from that play. They're going to have to move on from that game. They're going to have to move on from this tournament and losing out on, a, on an opportunity to win this tournament. They're going to have to move on and be really good this week at practice to prepare for their next opponent. Then they're going to have to really play hard against their next opponent and continue to do so throughout the season. Have to continue to get better every single day. But this, guys, this is the difference between winning and losing. These little details. The little details matter. And I always joke and say, you know, people call this a little thing. Like, oh, blocking out. Those are the little things that you have to do. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing. That's kind of the funny part about it. The things that people talk about as the little details or the little things are actually huge. They're big things. And the problem is, if you do this against teams that aren't that great or against other people that maybe aren't quite as good at you at what you do, maybe maybe it doesn't affect it. Maybe you continue to build that bad habit because you don't get exposed. But when you play against the best, when you compete against the best, when you're trying to get really big clients, big accounts, you are going to get exposed and your, your mistakes like this are just going to be magnified. When you play against the best teams, you get exposed and your, the details that you screw up get magnified. And that's just the reality. So you have to prepare every day, whether you're just preparing by yourself, again, in an empty gym with nobody there, to perfect those details, to master those details, so that when there are thousands of people watching a game, you don't get exposed. You don't want to get exposed against the best. You want to be able to compete against the best, and you want to be able to go mano a mano and see who that better team, that better player is. I've always told my players and my teams, if there's a team out there that's better than us, if we bust our butt, we play really, really hard, and we leave it all out there, I'm okay with the result. And they have to be too. That's part of this concept too. You've got to be able to move on and just understand you've got to make up for that difference. If they're maybe a little bit more talented, we've talked about that before. If they're more talented than you, if he or she is more talented than you, you have to make up for that difference by raising your effort level above theirs. But if you leave it all out there and you come up short, you got to live with that. And then you figure out how to do it a little bit different the next time. You can't hang your head on the past. You have to move on have to have that next play mentality. As a shooter in basketball, the last shot doesn't matter. There is literally not a thing that you can do about the last shot. There's not a thing that these Gonzaga players can do about that mistake, about those couple mistakes. There's not a thing they can do to change the outcome of the game now. So why cry over spilled milk? Why, why focus on something that you're never going to be able to go back and change? Move on to the next play. As a shooter, if you miss or make, it doesn't matter. The only shot that matters is the next shot. That's it. In basketball, in football, in baseball, volleyball, track, lacrosse, the only play, the only event, the only game, the only practice that matters is the next one. That's it. You cannot go back and change the previous ones, but you can get better at the next one. You can try a little bit harder on the next one. The only one that matters is the next one. Whatever your next one is, that is the only daggone one that matters. That's it. You have to forget about what's happened in the past. You can use it as motivation in that moment. You can think about and plan for how you're going to change things, for how you're going to improve. But your focus has to immediately shift to that next thing in front of you. The next game, the next practice, the next drill. Do not focus on the past. Because again, the difference between winning and losing is going to be being able to move on from it. You have to learn from it. Like I said, they have to learn from this mistake. Everybody, all of us, we have to learn from our past mistakes. But if we let it linger on, if we let it continue to affect us, it's going to kill us. It's going to be the difference between winning and losing. As a team, if you let something like that continue to affect you on a daily basis, continue to linger in your mind, 
you'll lose. If you learn from it, you watch the film, Coach Few plays it for these guys a million times today or maybe yesterday, and they learn from it right then and there and they figure out how to get better about it for the next one, perfect. Forget about it after that. You make sure it never happens again, but you don't think about it on a daily basis. You don't continue to think about that. You don't continue to think about that loss. You move on. If you miss a shot, quit thinking about that. Don't be the guy who misses a shot or travels and walks back, hangs his head. That half a second of you dropping your head could be the difference between a stop on defense and a made bucket. That hang in your head could be the difference between you staying in the ball game or getting pulled out by your coach. I know it would be for me. I'm okay with the mistake. I am not okay with you hanging your head on it. I am not okay with you feeling sorry for yourself. I am okay with you sprinting back. The other part of that is if you sprint back, I'm going to forget whether I have time to get you in and out of the game because the next play is going to happen so fast. That's something we all can learn from. Get over the mistake. Get over it. You have to. If you take time to sulk, if you take time to worry about it, you know what else everybody else is going to do? They're going to take the time to get better. They're going to get better at everything that you want to be really good at while you're thinking about your mistake. They're going to pass you because they're getting better while you're thinking, while you're feeling sorry for yourself. We all make mistakes, guys. We all do. Everybody messes up. Some screw-ups are bigger than others. But again, it doesn't matter. You have to figure out how to learn from it right this very second. Figure out how to learn from it right now and get out. Get over it. Especially within athletics. Especially within a game. If an official makes a bad call, what is you complaining about it going to do? How many of you have seen a call get reversed because someone whined about it? I've seen very few. And most of the time, it's really only because in basketball, a referee accidentally pointed the wrong direction. They don't, they don't change calls, guys. They don't. They have instant replay now. But the calls don't get overturned all that often. It does absolutely nothing for you to worry about that instead of moving on to the next play. In your life, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do you, your, you, your family, your friends any good to worry about what you haven't done right. You've just got to figure out how to do it better the next time. So that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. If, if you didn't eat right on Thanksgiving, if you didn't eat right all weekend, if you enjoyed yourself a little bit and went out with friends and family, had a couple adult beverages, it doesn't matter. You've got to now transition back to Monday. Today is the only day that matters. All this week, get over whatever you did or didn't do. Again, it is positive or negative. You can react a certain way to a little bit of success, get comfortable, think that you're, you got it on easy street while everybody else is continuing to work to catch you, and then they will catch you, and then they'll surpass you. Or you can pat yourself on the back real quick. You can fist pound yourself real quick. Get excited for about five seconds and then move right on to the next thing. How can you improve from that? That's my challenge to all of you this week and throughout the rest of this holiday season. How can you move on and get ahead and get better at what you need to be getting better at? I know I'm going to try to be and I'm, that's what I'm challenging you all to do. Don't think about what you didn't do right. Think about what you can do right today. Think about what you can do right the rest of the week and do it. We have to have that next play mentality. We have to move on to that next play, move on to the next day, move on to the next task, the next hour and get better every single day.